Hello, welcome to the third webinar presentation by the Underground Construction Association Young Members Group. And now I hope you're all familiar with our group and our goals. If you're not, let me give you a short introduction while you're checking out the homepage of our website, kind of see what it has to offer. Um, the resources, the events are where we list our webinars. Um, and then the ways you can participate. Uh, with You don't have to be a member of SME. Of course, we encourage it to obtain all the other great features that SME and UCA offer. But you don't have to be a member of SME to join our group. So to start, my, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Erin Clark. I'm one of the three members of the new UCA of SME Standing Committee for the UCA Young Members. I'm the Professional Development Chair, and I'm joined by Anthony Bauer, the Chair, and Shannon Goff, the University Outreach Chair. UCA Young Members are a group of professionals and students of all ages with a common interest to grow and develop the population of engineers and construction professionals under the age of 35 within the underground industry. Throughout the year, you can join us for monthly webinars and stay involved in the conversation by visiting our website at community.smenet.org backslash UCAYM, and it looks like this. On the website, you're able to gather more information on the group, and we encourage you to become a member of the group in order to take advantage of the many benefits the SME and UCA communities offer. At the annual RATC NAT conference, we will host a networking event for students and professionals age of 35 and under, and in a minute I'll talk a bit more about that event for this year. Our monthly webinars will be hosted on the last Wednesday of each month, with the exception of next month. Next month, join us on May 20th to hear Glenn Frank from JD Contractors present on underground construction in glacial deposits. As I mentioned, at this year's RETC conference in New Orleans, We'll be hosting a networking event for students and professionals age 35 and under to mingle and get to know each other. The event will be on Sunday, Jan June 7th at 7 p.m. and will include drinks and appetizers. The location is still be to be determined, so check back on our website in the coming weeks for an update. Please, please pass along this information to anyone you think might be interested, and make sure to consider the time of the event before booking your flights into town. Today, we continue the webinar series with a presentation by Kevin Schaefer on his research project at the Colorado School of Mines on predicting the geological conditions ahead of the tunnel boring machines. Kevin is a doctoral candidate in civil engineering and a fellow in the Smart Geo program at Colorado School of Mines. He has worked as an intern for QIT twice doing design and project management for underground and tunnel projects. Kevin, thank you for presenting to us today. When you're ready, please share your screen. Wonderful. Well, first off, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate you taking time out to, uh, to listen to this seminar, and I hope you enjoy it. So uh, my name is Kevin Schaefer. I am a doctoral student at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, I've been working on this project since I started here after finishing my undergraduate degree. And my project uh, focuses on predicting geologic conditions ahead of tunnel boring machines before they've been encountered. Just a brief outline for today. First, I want to go into a little bit of background, my background, um, just tell you a little bit about myself and where I've come from. And then I want to go into my graduate research, uh, overviewing uh, quite a few subjects there, uh, just talking to you about my research and what I'm doing and where I've gone uh, since I've started, and then wrapping up with some conclusions. So first, background. In my education, I got my, bas my bachelor's and my master's from the Colorado School of Mines, both my bachelor's uh, in the year of 2012, and then my master's uh, in the year of 2014, and I'm currently pursuing my PhD here as well. My interest in tunneling uh, came shortly after I graduated uh, with my bachelor's. I was enrolled in the master's program. I took a course in tunnel design uh, in 2012, and I just really found it uh, very enlightening and very interesting, and it really just motivated me to go into this to go into this industry uh, because of well the critical analysis and the complexity of the problems that I was introduced to, um, specifically just the many different fields uh, across which tunneling uh, participates in. It's really a multidisciplinary field, and that's really why I enjoy it. You really have to be on on top of a lot of different disciplines uh, to handle a lot of the projects. Uh, as was mentioned before, I've had some work experience, two internships with with Kiwit in the summers of 2010 and 2011, 
Uh, the first one working at a service mine up in Wyoming, uh, an underground project for their uh, water pumping system. And the second, I worked in 2011 also with Kiwit again in Pacifica, California on the Devil Slide project, for those of you who are familiar with that. And I worked on some of the final lining design uh, for that project. I also had an undergraduate research assistantship in the years of 2011-2012 here at the Colorado School of Mines before I entered into my graduate work here. So stepping into the graduate research now, uh, to preface this, first I want to go over just a little bit of an overview of what the research is. And then briefly, I want to set up a framework for electrical theory, which is what my, my project pertains to. And then I'd like to show you how that electrical theory can be applied to this this tunneling environment and, and then stepping into a little bit of the results from my project. So before I go into the details, I'd like to first just give note to the Center for Underground Construction and Tunneling here at the College School of Mines, which is a program that I'm a part of here that looks into a lot of different projects for tunneling and underground construction. And specifically related to this research is real-time imaging ahead of tunnel boring machines. Uh, off to the left bottom screen, you can see some electrical imaging image, image there. And off the right, you can see a seismic imaging uh, picture there as well. And these are kind of the two schools of thought for imaging uh, ahead of tunnel boring machines using geophysics. And I'll be specifically focusing on the electrical imaging side uh, of things. So briefly here, with just a little bit of electrical theory, I don't want to bore you too much, but um, it, it's kind of a needed framework to understand what's going on uh, for the details of my research. So if we consider this, this homogeneous wire here uh, with a diameter D, we can assume that this wire is kind of infinitely long, and it's just a cylinder. If we give the wire an electrical conductivity, which is measured in Siemens per meter, and we induce an electrical current through this wire, we induce it from one side of the wire to the other side of the wire, we'll create an electrical current density, which is measured as the amplitude of electrical current that I pass through the wire over the wire's cross-sectional area. After I've induced that electrical current uh, through the wire, I induce this electrical field, which is measured in volts per meter. And these are uniquely related to the electrical conductivity of the wire which is what we're interested in capturing. So um, geomaterials have a very, very large range for their electrical conductivity. There's a lot of research, uh, recent research in uniquely characterizing uh, specific soil types to their electrical conductivity. You can imagine this is kind of a difficult task, especially given the fact that multiple different geomaterials can display a single value for electrical conductivity. Um, for example, a material such as a, a till and a material such as a clay could demonstrate a similar electrical conductivity value of 10 to the negative second Siemens per meter. And so when we're measuring the electrical conductivity of materials, it's very difficult to uniquely identify them uh, as a specific lithological type. So extending on from the electrical theory, I want to talk about the geophysical methods, which are specifically called electrical resistivity. This is the name of the method. And what we do is we implore a set of four electrodes, here labeled as A, M, and B, on the surface of an infinite half space, or the Earth. Uh, the electrodes A and B are separated by a distance of A. If I inject a current traveling from electrode A to electrode B, I induce an electrical field similarly to what we saw on the wire on a previous slide as equal potential lines. And you can see that a couple of those equal potential lines are running up into the electrodes M and N. And M and N are what I use to measure my electrical potential. Now, in this case, we don't we have a we have a, a kind of a, a different case than this electrical wire theory that I presented before where for the electrical wire, I could only have one direction of current transmission. In this case, I have an infinite half space, and my electrical current can travel in three dimensions. So it makes it more of a complex problem, and you cannot just, um, you cannot directly translate from a measured, uh, sorry, an injected current and a measured electrical potential to get yourself an electrical conductivity, because that electrical conductivity 
could be a measurement of anywhere in that three-dimensional space. And as we know, soils are highly complex, they have stratifications, and they're not just homogenous. So this point P that I'm showing in this slide at a depth of A over 3 is kind of an estimation of all the different heterogeneities below the surface. So we're estimating an electrical conductivity. Now, um, uniquely identifying the spatial distribution of electrical conductivity below the surface is a difficult task. And I'm not going to get into that here, but um, just know that it exists. So translating from the electrical resistivity methods, uh, I want to just talk to you briefly about the um, a simplified version of the TBM uh, tunneling environment, where I have this cylinder that's located at a cover below the surface of the ground. And the TBM itself is really just a hollow cylinder uh, with, a, with a diameter. And at the end of this hollow cylinder, I have the main body of the TBM, which is comprised of both the TBM shield and the TBM cutter head. And then on the front of the TBM cutter head, I have these cutting tools that are used to rip apart the ground in front of the TBM and excavate the soil back. So if we take that electrode array that I introduced uh, previously, that A, M, and B electrode array, I can actually implement this in several different ways. There's just one shown here um, onto the TBM. And this is such that when I'm excavating soil material, as I advance the TBM, I'm taking different measurements uh, as, I'm, as I'm moving closer to, let's say, a geologic change ahead of the TBM. So the previous slide showed one electrode array that you could implement on a TBM. Here I'm showing several electrode arrays, um, all labeled A, M, and B, using different isolated components uh, of the TBM to take measurements. Now there are advantages and disadvantages of each including uh, feasibility of implementation. Some may be more feasible than others, and some projects uh, may not be able to implement a specific array. For example, if you look on the lower left-hand corner of the picture at fig subfigure D, you'll see that the electrode array has AM used as isolated cutting tools on the front of the cutter head. Now, you can imagine this might be difficult in, in the fact that the cutter head rotates uh, relative to a non-rotational shield. So here you cannot just directly hook up wires to those electrodes because as the cutter head rotates, it would twist the wires. So in this case, you would have to have what's called an electrical slip ring um, located inside of the TBM to be able to connect those electrodes without twisting the wires. This may not be feasible in every single tunneling project, but it's certainly uh, something that could happen if an electrical slip ring is present. So this project is about identifying geologic changes ahead of the tunnel boring machine, and I want to talk to you about how we measure those, those changes. What are we exactly looking for? Well, if we imagine this a planar difference in geology, I've labeled them here as sigma 1 and sigma 2 for vertical planar difference. Um, these could take on any value of electrical conductivity, but let's say in this case the electrical conductivity may resemble um, the TBM surrounded in a homogeneous sand, and we're coming up on an incoming uh, homogeneous clay in front of the TBM. And we want to be able to detect that, that difference uh, in, in geomaterial. So if we imagine ourselves located in this infinite half space, our tunnel is located at a cover C with a diameter D, and we're at an infinite distance away from this vertical planar difference, if we were to measure um, the voltage through our electrodes, M and N, at an infinite distance away from this vertical planar difference, you might imagine that we're not going to record any change um, as we increment towards this vertical planar difference. We're so far away that the measurement is just not changing, meaning we're not sensitive yet to this vertical planar difference. But if this, if this vertical planar difference increments itself relative towards the TBM, all of a sudden we might have this change where you can see the, the filled black dot now is a positive or a positive magnitude in delta V, this electrical potential measurement. And as we step closer and closer to this vertical planar difference, we're going to start to measure bigger changes because the vertical planar difference has more of an impact on measurement. And at some point, we're even closer 
and we've taken an even bigger uh, measurement in delta V. So we can make these curves that kind of look like this. One point that I want to make is uh, this point of electrical noise. So this is a this is a curve similar to what I've just shown. Um, electrical noise is a complicated issue when we're talking about uh, electrical resistivity measurements, especially applied to the tunnel boring machine environment, where there's a lot of different sources of electrical noise in the tunneling environment. These, may, these might come uh, just from electrical noise from, from the natural earth field, or these could come from electrical current leakage via the tunnel boring machine. In any case, um, there will be electrical noise present, and you might imagine that in a realistic field environment, if we have some noise threshold, there might be a point at which we cannot detect a geologic change ahead of the tunnel boring machine until we've crossed this noise threshold. So I'm showing in the bottom uh, right-hand region of this curve an undetectable region where the delta V has not reached the noise threshold. And then once it has reached the noise threshold, we are now able to detect this, this geologic change ahead of the tunnel boring machine. So I want to present to you uh, just a couple of example results from some computational modeling that I've done here on campus. My work includes uh, both computational modeling through finite element analysis, as well as laboratory investigation uh, through small-scale PBM models. And so uh, the results that I want to present to you here are through computational analysis. I use a finite element program called COMSOL, uh, which uses electrical current injection through three-dimensional bodies to then measure the induced electric field that I've created based upon my spatial distribution and electrical conductivity, and my spatial distribution thereby reflecting changes in geologic materials ahead of the tunnel boring machine. But for these example results, I want to focus on the electrode array that I've highlighted down in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, where I'm using isolated electrical cutting tools mounted on the front of the cutter head. I'm injecting out of electrode A, and I'm retrieving the electrical current through electrode B that is located outside of the tunnel lining um, in the earth, and I'm measuring the electrical potential between electrodes M and M. So this result is for a vertical planar difference, very similar to what I presented uh, uh, earlier in a few slides previous to this one. You'll see a sigma 1 and a sigma 2 of 0.1 Siemens per meter and 0.01 Siemens per meter, respectively. Uh, and these values could reasonably represent for a sigma 1 being that of a, of a clay and a sigma 2 being that of a sand, let's say. So for a 10 meter diameter TBM, this x over d distance uh, measured between the TBM and the vertical planar difference, as I decrease x over B, I move this vertical planar difference towards the TBM, you can see how my change in potential is increasing all the way up to just above 6 volts. Um, so you can see that the TBM through this electrode array is sensitive. I'm actually able to detect this incoming vertical planar difference before I've even reached it with my cutting tools. So if we then change the diameter of the TBM, we can see from this graph that the sensitivity to this incoming vertical planar difference is changing, meaning that if I increase from a 10 meter diameter TBM to a 15 diameter TBM, let's say, you can see that the red line here representing a 15 meter t diameter TBM is just above the 4 volt line, almost near the 5 volt line, but is less than that for a 10 diameter TBM, 10 meter diameter TBM, excuse me. And so we are less sensitive if we have a larger TBM. If we move then down to a 2-meter diameter TBM, which might resemble that of a microtunnel uh, boring machine, we have the greatest sensitivity. And I believe this result really is from uh, the influence of the TBM itself. The TBM is largely metallic and therefore has a very high electrical conductivity, especially compared to that of uh, the soil around the TBM. And so if we decrease the size of the TBM, we, we have less of an influence um, to current flow that the TBM will have. So stepping away a little bit from this sensitivity, I wanted to show you what it looks like to image these 
these changes ahead of the TBM? What does the imaging look like? So if you'll focus first on the right side of this, um, of this image, you'll see a cross section of the TBM. This circle is meant to represent the outer, uh, the outer diameter of the TBM. We're looking right in front of the TBM. And we have this electrode A that's located in the very center um, of the TBM cutter head. And then we have this electrical potential measurement electrode uh, M. And that's positioned at various angles uh, along, uh, along the, well, not the outer circumference, but uh, uh, some inner radius of the TBM cutter head. And as the cutter head is going to rotate, we can see from the figure in the middle that we're actually more sensitive to this boulder that I've positioned in the upper left-hand quadrant of the TBM cutter head. We're actually more sensitive um, for an electrode that is mounted at the 45 degree uh, mark than any other angle. And that's because our potential measuring electrode is, is then in line with this boulder. So you can really see from the center figure that, that we can, our ability to pick out these finite anomalies in front of the TBM is real. We can detect these anomalies through the rotation of the cutter head. So, and then um, to finish up the seminar, I just want to just go over just a little bit of some my conclusions. So just some career challenges. I don't have a lot of career challenges because I've moved straight through school, um, but I do have a little bit of work experience. And I can say that moving for internships um, after going through my years at school and then moving for the summer and moving back to school um, was tough, although it was only for three months. Oh, excuse me, sorry. It was only for three months. Uh, was challenging uh, in that I had to be separated from my spouse. I had to be separated from my family. Uh, and that was a challenge for me, although very much worth it because I did gain some valuable experience with those internships. Uh, another career challenge, um, moving straight through school has been a challenge. Uh, I've been here for uh, seven years now through my undergrad, and um, school, is, school is difficult, although I do gain unique, unique experiences through here. Um, I'll definitely be excited to graduate and move into, and move into industry for at least a little while. Uh, also, another career challenge is I was speaking on this a little bit earlier, but the work in underground construction and tunneling is is really complex in that, and it's multidisciplinary in that you have a lot of fields coming together to work on a single project. Um, you have soil behavior, you have structural analysis, there's geophysics in, in what I've described in my research. You have geolo geology and geologic engineering, electrical engineering, fluid mechanics, uh, and a lot of other disciplines. And all these disciplines really have to work uh, together to create a successful project. Um, and so although it is really great in that there's a lot of disciplines to move uh, into this field, it is challenging in that you do, you do need to know a little bit about a lot of things uh, in order to make a project successful. Uh, and a little bit of advice I would have for young engineers um, is, is that some engineers have come up to me and asked me about, you know, if I go into this tunneling industry, am I going to be pigeonholed? Uh, into just tunneling, do I have any other, if I, if I decide to change my mind later and go into a different industry, um, am I going to be pigeonholed in just tunneling? And my, my response to that is along the same lines of what, I've, of what I've just said in working in the underground industry is that there's a lot of different fields, there's a lot of disciplines, and you gain a lot of experience in each if you want to. And so um, you don't need to feel like you're, like you're trapped, you're going to gain a lot of experience. Uh, in a lot of disciplines, and so uh, it's it's really it's a really great place to be and a great place to work right now. So um, I feel good about being here, and I, and I have a lot of uh, lot of knowledge in a lot of different fields. So with that, I would just like to open up the seminar for any questions. I've given my contact information off on the right hand side for those of you that have questions for me uh, after the seminar although I'm open to answering questions now. So um, I'll take questions as you have them. Kevin, this is Heather from SME. I'd just like to thank you so much for this detailed presentation today. Um, we do have a question submitted, and okay. I'd like to encourage all of our attendees to go ahead and use the chat panel uh, yes. to submit questions to the SME hosts. Um, that's me, and I'll read them off um, as we are recording today's session. 
Um, so the first question reads, as you mentioned, many soil types have similar electrical conductivity. Have you found that those materials have similar ground characteristics, i.e., the TBM will react similar to those types of soil? Um, how do, I guess I'm, I'm confused on how they mean by react. Is there, is there any room for some clarification on that question? Um, let's see here. I'm not seeing a response yet. Okay. The only thing that I would have to say oh, is um, that... Okay, the, qu the question here. came back is, will conditions of the TBM have to be changed? Um, so conditions, I'm, I'm going to assume meaning like rust or cutter head rotations um, or fixed pressure, let's say. Yeah. So this is so this is an area um, that I'm currently researching on right now um, by varying different TBM parameters. Um, one one major one being tunnel face pressure and how that and how that changes electrical conductivity of soil materials. So the 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 biggest research right now in electrical conductivity of materials is relating um, their characteristics being porosity, saturation, uh, clay content, salinity of the pore space fluid um, to their electrical conductivity. And if you change, let's say, the face pressure of the TBM, you're going to greatly affect, let's say, the porosity of, of your geomaterials ahead of the TBM. So yes, um, as you're changing your tunneling conditions, they I would expect that they would uh, very much influence the electrical conductivity of materials ahead of the TBM. I hope that answers your question. Okay, great. Thank you, Kevin. The next question mm -hmm. reads, have you considered water effects or high-pressure water tunnels? Um, n no, not, not directly. We have not. Um, but I do know that electrical resistivity methods are capable um, of identifying a, l a large range of electrical conductivities. Um, and so I would imagine that high pressure conditions would, you know, give a unique or, so or semi-unique uh, electrical conductivity case for a specific soil. Um, and so this would, this would alter the, the methods a little bit. Great. Uh, this next question reads very similar to that. Um, what is the influence of water on the way conductivity develops in the soil mass? Yeah, so uh, electrical conductivity is, is highly influenced by water content. There's a lot of literature uh, given on this, on this fact, um, but saturation is directly related to, to electrical conductivity. Um, so the more saturation you have, the greater electrical conductivity you have. So you're filling m more voids with uh, water, which is more conductive than, let's say, air. Great, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. The next question, uh, there's two questions, and they're very similar, so I'm going to combine them. Um, the attendees are asking uh, if you have any projects coming up in which you can field test uh, these methods for real-life data. Yeah, so this is something that we're, we're currently looking into uh, for a field approach to these methods. We're pretty confident, well, I'm very confident that, that these methods could be successful in the field um, and so at this point right now, it's narrowing down uh, a project and uh, a client and contractor who are going to be uh, motivated to put this research on to it, onto their TBM so where we can take measurements. Excellent. The next mm -hmm. question reads, is it possible to incorporate the electrical look ahead monitoring with face probing ahead of the TBM? Yes. Um, this is a question I've actually had before um, in that, so face probing it gives you a little bit of information, a uh, very finite point along the tunnel alignment for soils. Um, something that, that I commented on previously is that electrical conductivity is, is really hard to uniquely characterize soil material. So if we're looking on this, I think everyone can still see my, my screen, um, but if we go back to that slide that shows the ranges of electrical conductivities, um, multiple different geomaterials can display the same electrical conductivity. So if we're able to face probe ahead, that gives us a more unique solution in that we can actually see the material uh, coming out of the probe um, there. So we're able to more uniquely identify what soils are ahead of the, of the TBM. 
That's great, Kevin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this last question um, reads, consider what might be done to dope the material ahead, perhaps making whatever you hope to find either more or less conductive, and therefore perhaps easier to identify from a greater distance? Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly the, the greater the electrical conductivity, the better. Um, so yeah, that would be a good consideration. Excellent. Uh, the next question reads, what is the distance ahead of the face for a standard TBM, say six meters, that this technology can work? So it depends, like I said um, on a previous, uh, on one of the ending slides here for the diameter of the TBM. So it really depends on what diameter of TBM you have um, regarding kind of the sensitivity to an incoming difference. So um, let's say for a six meter t diameter TBM, um, this five meter one is pretty close. So I wouldn't expect it to change uh, significantly. But for a five meter diameter TBM, our look ahead distance could be on the order of say five, five diameters ahead or 25 meters ahead of the TBM. For this specific contrast um, in electrical conductivity now, that's subject to change uh, based upon your contrast in electrical conductivity and also the size of your contrast. For example, that boulder that I showed in the next slide here, um, our sensitivity to that is much lower because it's such a small difference compared to this large homogeneous medium surrounding the TBM. That's great, Kevin. Thank you so much. I believe that was the last question so far for today. Um, would you like to make okay. any closing statements? Uh, just thanks, everyone, for coming. I appreciate your questions, and I appreciate you listening. Um, so if you have any questions further, please email me uh, at the email address here, and I'll be happy to answer any more questions that you have. But uh, have a great day, and thanks for listening. That's great, Kevin. Thanks again for presenting today. And we'd like to remind attendees that today's session was recorded and will be available shortly on the UCA Young Members website and I'll be sending out an email to everyone who is registered for today's session um, when that video is available. Um, thanks again, and we hope you can all join us on May 20th for our next UCA Young Members webinar. And have a great day, everybody.